Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. Welcome to the 15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival protected by the tall Banega Swast India at Front Lawn. We'd like to welcome you to first edition presents Noted Grief. Publisher, poet, photographer, and founder of the acclaimed independent house Siegel Books, Naveen Kishore was recently awarded the 2021 Ottawa Award for the promotion of international literature. His poems on Kashmir post 5th August are ember eyed, grieving, and hopeful. He writes of the knotted stories of betrayal, mourning, and the thread made red well before the great bleeding. His other poems explore themes of revolt, renewal, the act of writing, the weight of memory, and moments of awareness. Ranjit Hoskote is a poet, cultural theorist, and curator. His collections of poetry include Vanishing Acts, Central Time, and Jonah Whale. His new collection, Hunch Prose, is a fierce testament to the urgency of existential contemplation, what affirms humanity. Where is its home in a world noted by suffering, both salient and silent? One dotted line away from extinction here. Kishore and Hoskote discuss their work and the powerful pro provoking poetry of grief. Naveen Kishore established Siegel Books in 1982, a publishing program in the arts and media, focusing on drama, film, art, literature, and culture studies. Kishore is a photographer who has extensively documented female impersonators from Manipuri, Bengali, and Punjabi theater practices. Some of these pictures were exhibited as a part of the show titled Woman, goddess and more recently in the exhibition green room of the goddess in 2019 his suite of color images from the performing the goddess project were exhibited at the vancouver art gallery as a part of the moving still exhibition kishore is the recipient of many honors and awards ranjit hoskote is a poet critic cultural theorist and independent curator who's the recipient of numerous awards. His collections of poetry include Vanishing Acts, Central Time, Jonah Whale, and Hunch Prose. His translation of a celebrated 14th century Kashmiri woman mystics poetry has appeared as I Lala, the poems of Lal Diet. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to welcome on stage Tabina Anjum. Tabina Anjum is a journalist, media educator, and an internationally acclaimed visual storyteller. She is born and brought up in Kashmir. She reports on politics, gender, human rights, migrant rights, and issues impacting marginalized communities from Rajasthan, and also covers socio-political issues related to the Hindi heartland of India. She presently writes for the Outlook magazine from Rajasthan and is also an adjunct professor with Haridev Joshi State Journalism University in Rajasthan. Sabina Anjum is going to introduce the session. Over to all of you. Hello, thank you. Before we begin, begin, it's customary for poets and would-be poets to invoke the gods of poetry. And there is also this sort of sense that you belong to a kind of long tradition. And so in that spirit, I want to start with two short poems by Ranjit Hoskote, who has just also been awarded the Mahakavi Kanaiya Lal Setia Award. And I think it's important to celebrate before we begin the grieving. So thank you. Uh, two poems. The first one is called Sand. In the kingdom of sand, the three-eyed man is king. He measures the dunes by what's left of meteor trails and camel tracks 
trusts only what he can smell. Cloth is a cage, so he wears what's real. Nudges the trapped horizons awake, calls out to his horseman in sparse flashes of lightning. When the rain comes, it will be war. And he can see the script unraveled three ways, every single time. An eye for each tense, one tight eye to shut out the wind, one eye that was taken for an eye, one eye wide as the ocean, as forgiving, with which he once saw a bird swoop down on a listing ship, perch, take wing, circle, point across the tsunami of sand. Can it bring him home? And you can, don't be inhibited, clap. Okay. <laughs> the, the second poem is Bone Setter. This is a great favorite of mine for some reason. You mend what's snagged, fix what's gone out of true. The bulging knuckle, the scuffed runaway shoe that hides the spur, the cracked femur, the twisted knee, stoic. You repair us for combat. We go out again and again at the emperor's pleasure. But in the end, the arena takes no prisoners. We walk out holding our heads high in our stiff raised hands, your sutures, an embroidery of carbon dust. Thank you, Ranjit. It's, uh... thank you so much, uh, Naveen. It's, uh, it's such a Naveen gesture. When the occasion is a celebration of his book, he opens this up with, with his characteristic generosity and grace to, to friends and colleagues. It's, I really, really appreciate this, Naveen, but we will now focus on this marvelous book that you've produced, Knotted Grief, and Tabina, I'm gonna ask you to bring us to order. Hello, yeah. Thank you so much, Naveen. Thank you, Ranjit. It's uh, indeed a beautiful moment to share the stage with two of my favorite people. Ranjit, of course, is one of my favorite poems. I mean, he wrote Ayalala at the time when I was searching for something appropriate, something close to what she has written, and I found his book. Thank you, Ranjit. And Naveen. Naveen's contribution, we all know, has been remarkable his publishing house, the work he has done in theater, in film, all of us know about it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Naveen, for writing this beautiful, beautiful book, Knotted Grief. It's a beautiful book. It's set up in Kashmir. It's a book full of verses, takes me back to my homeland, takes me back to my homeland in 1950s, of homeland in 1960s, and of course, after 2019, how the land looks now in these unjust times. Naveen's book is about grief. It's about how humans inflict grief upon each other. It's about longing. It's about remembrances. It's about, it's about love. It's about hatred. It's about uh, hope. So it has six segments. And the first segment is Kashmiriyat, which has beautiful 150 words talk about, you know, uh, times before 2019. It talks about 1950s, 1960s, the years when Naveen had his childhood days in the valley. So he reminisces those beautiful days and his later association with the valley also when he used to visit there regularly. So Raveen has, uh, in his book, he has, uh, he has written about large scale human tragedies and familiar habits in the same cover. And uh, without taking much of your time, I'll start with the, uh, first poem, Uncaged This Long Ailing Night, Left to Die, like an aging raven, unused to flying flailing, its wings mortified this cagelessness humiliating. 
smothered flame of candle crushed between thumb and forefinger charred night is this or is this the dream i came home to is this or is this the dream i came home to dog sniffing blood on chinar leaves three quick points they bury shadows here every night under a moon known for its brazenness without sky lamenting its own drowning J scattered beneath the stones reams and reams of poetry i've read this book and most and this book is more about the stories from kashmir the tragedies the stories the told untold story that he has put up in these verses it's less about kashmir and more about the stories so uh, ranjit over to you yeah thanks so much uh, tabina in fact navin if we could begin by Uh, really thinking about how the site of remembrance plays such a major role in so much that you do uh in your photography for instance uh in your poetry and it's amazing that this is your first book after decades of writing poetry and working with linguistic experiments somewhere in the intermediate zone between prose and poetry but when i read not at grief what came strongly to mind was also uh your photographic series on auschwitz so could i ask you to 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 talk about this this need to return to and revisit sites of remembrance sites of anguish of rep of state repression and uh suffering on on such a scale that it remains uh, a kind of a monument to which we rededicate ourselves Sure. Um, you know this whole business of humanity and humanity, um, memory, forgetting, um, the fact that you're ostensibly writing about Kashmir, but you're also writing about Palestine or Syria or the northeast of our country or all kinds of troubled spots, and you're not. What you're doing is that you're going in and out of. all of those memories which you think you lost but which are also uh, a kind of snap of your finger away when you need them when you're obsessed with some form of an injustice or a need to resist in the only way you know how uh, through your practice whether it's writing which i do every day for the last 10 years um through the photography through the theater through the publishing itself so in my head it's um you know the sort of fact and fiction uh of my entire way of being and my entire sort of elasticity of practicing what i do i say elasticity because it goes off in all kinds of directions it's so on so forth um and memory obviously plays uh, you know you, you but then of course the, the the question is that do you remember exactly or uh is memory memorable at a particular time and then it changes because you're crafting something from god knows where and when and how and there is a sense of receiving memory when you consciously set out to write or in my case not so consciously set out to write so much as use writing as a kind of practice that you have to every day do this this business of you know it's like music in a sense which also has to do with memory and remembering but in a different disciplined kind of manner um and yes the the sort of uh, the, the auschwitz connection or or what i like to call death tourism uh where we celebrate in a different sort of way where we we sort of relive but we relive them now through our technology and our phones and so on and so forth so that body of work that you refer to was quite done like that um but it resonates and and to me the atrocity just changes its alphabet or its name or its locale but the basic 
repression or authoritarianism or injustice doesn't fade away. And writing is a way of, I think, coping and resisting. And even though it's called knotted grief, I like to believe that there's a lot of hope. The trope of knotting reminds me also of the fact that there are multiple histories that are entwined here. Uh, it's also um, a reminder that in some sense, partition was an original wound here in South Asia. And it's just replayed itself over and over again in different forms of schism and scission and, and violent division. Could I draw you out on this? I mean, the, the, the possibility yes. that partition is like a primal, a, sure. a primal drama for you, which replays itself yeah. through these memories. Yeah, it is, a, it is like for a lot of us who were born uh, shortly after partition and inherited presence, you know, so therefore memory again comes into play. And my parents were from Lahore, my father in fact, and that's the real Kashmir connection very briefly, which is that he used to work for the Oberoi's in Lahore and um, he stayed back after partition to smuggle out uh, colleagues and friends and family and was helped by his Muslim friends and, you know, grew his beard and his hair and they slowly got him across the border and he was re-employed by the Oberoi. So if, in those days, the film stars had not discovered, you know, the joys of snow and shooting in snow in Kashmir. So the Oberoi Palace Hotel that he worked at used to be shut for four months and we would be in Calcutta for the winter months. And for those eight months, of course, we were there growing up and so on and so forth. And um, I think that's where the initial Kashmir thing would have begun. But um, I had never really, it's interesting, I'd never heard a single partition story from my father. Um, not at all an unhappy being, full of life, the joy de vivre, and never quite, it wasn't as if he avoided the topic. If you spoke to him, it would be a memory he would recount very matter-of-factly about the fact that his father, my grandfather, was the librarian of the Punjab University, you know, that kind of thing, but never a direct trauma was ever mentioned. It was my grandmother, on the contrary, who was much more graphic. So my first encounter with what people do to each other uh, was through the memories that I inherited through the grandmother, in a sense. I don't know if that answers your question a little. Um, and then that, you know, for, I'm not a very analytic human being. I, I never sort of... Um, I cannot exist in chronology. I'm either existing retrospectively or I'm existing in the future. Um, and by, by sheer happenstance, I happen to be in the present too. So it's like a kind of flux, right? So, and we give it all kinds of names, and, but mostly, which is why I think my writing practice is also fragmentary, the dailiness, and the unpredictably of my publishing existence, which is not a routine one. Each day is a different kind of day that you... So within that, you practice it, and therefore you're constantly close to interruption. And therefore, the writing is shorter, fragmentary, and you know, therefore the poetry as a form lends itself to the fragmentary. But I'm also thinking of another form at which you excel, although it's not a public articulation. It's your correspondence, You're like a sort of an 18th century figure. You have ongoing correspondence with some of the most amazing minds of, uh, of the planet, Alexander Kluger, Giorgio Agamben, among them. So how does that, if you will, performance of self or sharing of, of, of subjectivity what relationship does that have to the rest of your prose, which uh, I don't mean this in any way other than descriptive. It tends to be scattered across, say, the Seagull catalogs or other things. It's kind of, okay, like you said, it's fragmentary. It's a series of occasional publications. So, so this would be, and there's a linked question, but this is something that, because in some sense, your private correspondence is much more um, consistent, if you will, except that none of us are going to read it for now. 
Yeah, well, very briefly, the sort of, um, the, 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 I, I have an exact moment when I discovered the joys of writing 20 page longhand letters. And this was a, a bhua, an aunt, a pishi of mine who turned Radha Swami, as in the Radha Swami of Vyas, and uh, which is a sect that practices meditation. And she sent me some, you know, and on average, I would get about six or seven books every so many months. And I was so fond of her that I religiously read them. And I was attracted to it because it was very scientific what was being preached. But she would also not stop at the books. She would write these long letters and actually the exquisite handwriting, almost calligraphic. And they sort of drove me into the arms of the British Council Library and the American libraries, so on and so forth, to look for works of deep philosophy to show my erudition. And I started to read Russell in late school, not understanding stuff like that. And so that I could be erudite and not let her down. That's how the getting hooked happened. You know, this, this business of being able to put pen to paper in a certain kind of way. Much later when I was reincarnated, uh, you know, the seventh time around, post my theater life into a publisher, I discovered that you know, across languages, I was comfortable in corresponding with all these wonderful minds, right? And the one short story here, and that should, I think, sum it up. I'm in correspondence even as we speak for the last six, seven years with a German writer called Reinhard Jürgen, who was originally from East Berlin. And he doesn't do emails and he does not do English. So he writes his 20, 30, 40 pages, literally, I'm not making this up, in German. He types mercifully. So these are sent to a literary translator at 95 pounds per thousand words. So that's roughly about 800 euros a letter. And then I have to respond to, the translator mails it to me. I then write my, not to be outdone, 20, 30, 40 words, uh, pages which are then translated by an English to German literary translator. And these get produced in what Segal catalogs, of course. And what is nice about these letters is that they talk about anything and everything. And in one of these letters, he wrote to me some years ago in 2017 that I have decided not to be ever published again. And then hastening to assure me in case I misunderstood, he said, but I will continue to write for my drawer. Now, my antenna with Auschwitz on one side and East Germany, the wall, I immediately thought clandestine because that's what they would do. You would write for your drawers and you would hide away your writing and so on and so forth. So I, of course, disagreed with him vehemently, but also being the courteous being I think I am, I said, this is your choice, of course. But, you know, I think and I hope that this, you will one day return to this and change your mind. And uh, he hasn't as yet, it's been five, six years, but he continues to write to me and we have this special correspondence. And his German publisher is very hopeful that one day these letters would lead to him returning to the fold kind of thing. It, it's also particularly important to think about how what we produce as books uh, are actually not isolated objects, they're part of ongoing currents of preoccupation or other commitments. In your case, you've always been particularly sensitive to conflict zones and to the exactions that conflict makes, particularly on younger people. And uh, I, I would see this book also in that context. So could I ask you to talk about the work that you and the <laughs> colleagues at Seagull did on PeaceWorks? Sure. Yeah. Um... So, you know, uh, so in our seagull lives, uh, there's been the pre-Gujarat and the post-Gujarat. The pre-Gujarat saw us not being great flag wavers or at the barricades in a physical terms. We were not very good. We were awkward at throwing ourselves into the fray physically, like say Mahashwata Devi would. Um, uh, or like Anuradha, Anuradha Kapoor, my wife, who's, you know, on the streets. Um, but um, what 
used to come across as our political humanitarian just position was the choice of books. You could pick up any book and it, for the sensitive, it showed what kind of politics you had. Then Gujarat happened and I really wanted to stand in the middle of the road and flagellate myself. And, you know, there was rage and one turned it into many things. But the one concrete thing we turned into, we said we must turn to young people using the arts. That was our forte, theater and cinema and painting and music and teach them to learn with difference, to sort of learn to live with difference. And that became an intervention which has now led to the history of a piece where we're talking about shared memories, where in Bangladesh, they would look at the same incident in a certain way. In Pakistan, they would look at the same incident. And what do, how, what do teachers do? How do they deal with all of this and so on and so forth? So yes, the, uh, your, I, I agree that the, 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 well, it's not conflict zones so much that attract, but it's conflict that is unnecessary. And we are all in the midst of it, especially in today's time where uh, there is nothing to do but to stand up and be counted. It's, 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 it's just that. And in that sense, this book does precisely that. I mean, it, it's, it's a testament to these times. But here, uh, it's actually a question. We've been circling around the book, but now here's a question on the book. You've never before this wanted to put your poems or your texts together. This is, so could you tell no, us this how is, this book this, came to be? This is absolutely, absolutely not true. I have desperately wanted to be published and um, I've always wanted to be, but you know, the thing is as a publisher, one half of the world, in other words, your publishing friends think, hey, you're hotshot, second best publisher in the world, do your own book. So they never approach you, you'll never get discovered. Uh, you're too shy to sort of put a manuscript out there. So it's just like a first time author thing, as I keep telling my publishing school students. Uh, so you wait to be discovered and um, in great hope. And that's what accidentally happened, which is that um, A, I was constantly writing every day and I was sharing this with, you know, maybe 20, 30 people across the world poets across languages, friends, a sort of circle of affection. So you knew that there was perhaps some merit in some of it and so on and so forth. And because they were daily, they were across subjects, across all kinds of um, provocations of the times that you responded to. And then these used to begin to come out in some journals here, there, America, etc. One Australian publisher friend who has a poetry list found some of these poems and said to me, I said, yes, said he in good Australian. And I said, um, yes, almost like I was being accused of something. So he says, why don't you write a book for us? I said, well, I don't have a manuscript because I can't take a breather to turn one in. And that's when a translator friend of mine, Tess Lewis in New York, said, just give me your 600 or whatever you've got on the subject of Kashmir and let me see what I can do. So she put together a earlier draft version of this, which I sent to Gazebo Books, my Australian publisher, who said, no, 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 but we want all of those 600. So we sent all of them and they curated very magnificently. They immersed themselves in six months, worked with an Indian poet they published, tried to understand references. And then I got, you know, the sort of joy of being published only in Australia and New Zealand, which gave me courage when I got the PDF to share with you know, people, Raj Kamal Prakashan, they said, yes, Hindi. I spoke to Ravi DC, Malayalam. So suddenly it's coming out in Hindi and Malayalam and Marathi and Punjabi and Bengali and so on and so forth um, in Urdu in Pakistan. So it, that gave me courage to go to Speaking Tiger, who I admire because they publish Ravi, uh, Ravish Kumar and Jerry Pinto and, you know, other friends. Uh, and they said, yes. And so now suddenly you had a book. And now having tasted blood um, and the Australian wanting a... <laughs> A uh, second book, which uh, something called Mother Muse Quintet, uh, which has to do with my mother. And uh, gosh, you can't get away from potential Bengali men and their mothers. But anyway, um, so yes, that's how it is. It's not that I didn't want to be, but it wasn't a preoccupation. This is true. I mean, the act of writing, and this is the only thing that one takes away from this conversation, the act of writing, the dailiness, you know, and you're, you're amongst people who know this, there are people in the audience who know this, 
That is what is vital because that is how you defy the times. Naveen, I'm going to take the liberty of reading from one of the sections of Pleasure. the book. Please, lovely. It's nice to hear your <laughs> poems being read by other people. This is from the section called Street Full of Widows. Across the barbed wire, bisecting the curfew, stand three women, their bodies covered in black. Only the red of the eyes guides them to graveyards, covered in snow this month of August, foretelling the bitter winter. Watch the men run, die, streets full of widows. The deserted street allows the child to play hopscotch. She hops on one leg, then the other, muttering names of missing friends under her breath. The lake waters listen in silence. No one speaks ill of the dead here. No one speaks. Tongue hidden deep in your throat, you swallow. At the end of the longest street, crouching shadows awaiting transport. Just when you think you have seen enough, the night explodes and another day begins. There are no more white lilies in the valley. Did you write that? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. This is your poetry. But a quick question pinned to that, which is whether it's here or in a beautiful text that you wrote in response to a work by the sculptor Anish Kapoor, it is very, very strongly aligned with uh, what one might cautiously call a position of female experience or female anguish. Do you want to speak to this? I don't know. I've always... Uh... I mean, at the slightly lighter Wayne level, for years when I'm corresponding with American university presses, the Europeans never have a confusion. But uh, at least three specific instances when I disappointed the people I'd been corresponding with for two, three years, when you finally met them, they were disappointed I was not a woman. Apparently, my letters were like a woman and the name Naveen, I suppose, you know, that kind of thing. But jokes aside, I, I really don't know. I mean, I don't have a specific. It's not like you set out to. Yes, there was a time when, again, as a present for Anu, because she works in, um, uh, you know, this area of violence, uh, you know, domestic violence. And uh, I had written a series of one woman uh, monologues in the voice of a single woman, a battered voice, which was performed by Pushan Kripalani. And um, yeah, so I think sometimes it's, I really don't have an answer. It just goes in and out of that. It's not a conscious thing. So, but I'm glad that it is there. And if somebody picks upon it, uh, because it's not just writing about, it's the voice itself sometimes that resonates in the head of women and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, I don't set out to claim anything else. Thank you so much, Naveen, for writing these beautiful, beautiful verses. I'm sure the two small poems from the first section, from the first segment, Kashmiriyat. Nobody sings any longer, no. Nobody sings any longer, no. Not even in this valley once on song, except, except the dead, the dead humming in whispers about their dying. Mirror, vast and silent, the oars precise slice its stillness, a different rhythm, gunfire, intermittent echoes ringing, ringing in ears, made deaf by a silence, intimate with roadside graves. Done. Thank you so much for writing these. I mean, you know, some of your uh, poems that you have written, like, you know, are actually after, you know, August 5, 2019. So how do you, you know, put the pain, the unsaid, 
you know, misery in your poems? How did you do that? Did you visit the valley after 2019 no, or? No, not at all. In the sense that it's all a sense of, uh, it's again going back to remembering. It's also going back to an imagined sense of what this could mean to those of us in a privileged position elsewhere. Uh, it's also a sort of, um, I don't know, a kind of signaling empathy of a certain kind in as feeble a way as you can with your words. Uh, yeah, I think just that really. Um, also, you have to remember that all of my writing is an impulse that, that just happens first and then one can explain it. And often I can't explain it even when I read it, right? So it's not like some mystical experience or anything of the kind, but when you're in the throes of something, and this is true of the photographic practice, it's true of the publishing, where in the throes of something, you're up and close with something that you're reliving, uh, right? A moment on a street which you're shooting as shyly as you can, or a moment in your head about an imagined sense of suppression somewhere, um, or a book that is in some Slovakian language that you're not familiar with, but you're putting your faith into. So, you know, when you're doing that, um, it's later in repos or in sessions or in discussion with friends who make you think, which is exactly why I was telling Rajit that we should not have a discussion about this yeah. till we have a discussion about this. But tell me something, there's use of autumn and chenars. How do you see them very relevant in your poetry? How do they... Seasons always, because, you know, there's, you know we, we, we're all familiar with what poets do with chenar colors changing in autumn and uh, winter and, you know, what, what it means at gunpoint, so to speak, and, or, or under a jackboot and so on and so forth. So it, it, yeah, it's just, again, memory, really. Sure. Okay, like someone in a breath play, I'm going to reach out of the frame to ask the time managers how we're doing for time. Oh, super. If there's time, should we then break a... the frame yet again and invite questions from our before we invite and questions? Can I, can I, will you indulge me? Because I, I wanted to read a short bilingual poem about my aging beauty. So, if I may, just one second. खोखले शब्द सूखे रेगिस्तान की याद दिलाते हैं कमबख्त बढ़ती उम्र बदलती हुई हाथों की लकीरें और चंद लम्हों की धुंधली याद के सहारे इस दिल को अब जनाब हम बहलाते हैं यू वॉच विथ फियर योर हैंड्स चेंजिंग इवन एज यू राइट द वेन्स मोर विजिबली फरोड द स्किन लेस टॉट फोल्डेड a fleeing freshness that has taken leave without saying goodbye. You feel dizzy at the thought that soon you will lose grace, strength. Collect then the voices and the words and the winds to show your friends these ghost traces. Thank you. All questions have to be addressed to Ranjit. If there are any questions, please. Uh... Yeah, we can see some hands there. Yeah. Mike can travel or, uh, yeah. Wow, we have Anish and friends in the front row. Mr. Deep is not allowed to ask questions. Everybody else can. There's too much erudition here. May I? <laughs> so actually your last poem completely derailed me in exactly what you just said. It was so beautiful, moving and heartfelt. And Urdu Vari Shairi or Bangla Kovita Moto Nektak Shundur, the personal genius chilo. So my theoretical question went for a toss. Good man. <laughs> anyway, I want to ask you this because it's not so much about theory, but more your visual practice that enters your poetry on the page, which I see very uh, clearly because your black and whites play with the bipolarity of light and shade, of course, at one essential level. Similarly, on the, on the 
the book which I've been enjoying the last two days, um, the off-white, untarnished uh, sepia pages with the white ink, but the minimalism is doing the same thing. Not only that, you go further um, into erasing and unerasing, strike through and taking the strike through out quite like Tagore maybe, but not at all like him. So I want to, you to address that because it's such an important conscious choice because it really makes the poetry, you read it all, with all the words and then you have to read it without those words and that creates a fantastic tension. The other thing of course is probably it's Shunandini's uh, design element is the way you use the, I'm forgetting the name of that particular icon that little wavy thing. Yeah, that's hers, yeah. Yeah, and you use it in the front um, before the book begins on the second page. And then at the end, I mean, there has to be some meaning to it, clearly. I mean, it's just fascinating. It's, a, it's theatrical in a sort of almost absurdist style, a minimalist style. But you've actually answered it all. It's precisely that, I'm sure, in the sense that uh, Shurandri would be best qualified for it. But I think for her, it's, it's like a little curtain razor. You've turned the page, you have a little flourish, you take a breath, you plunge, right? So it's that kind of a thing. But this business of the um, other practices, the theater, the lighting, the black and white photography, yes. I mean, I see images which I then transcribe as fragments or poems or whatever. And I think because I like shooting a certain kind of motion in a desperation to capture it in a certain kind of way, and particularly in theater, um, the poetry too tries to capture that, but with sound. They are meant to be read aloud, you know, as a lot of poetry, in fact, is meant to be read aloud. But mine, in this case, I actually make sense. I actually read them like you would a dialogue in a play. You know, a written dialogue can sound different from one that is oral, one you can hear it, and so on and so forth. The strike through is a kind of, um, it's a bit like uh, sharing a vulnerability. There you're fine honing a poem, but you, you know, like a good cinematographer lingering over shots when you're directing a film. It's a bit like that. You don't want to let go of your first effort. So you share that, you know, that's it really. One last question, maybe. We have one, one and a half minute maybe. left. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Naveen. Hi, Ranji. My question is to both of you. So, um, when we're writing, I'm, I'm a fellow poet too. So when we're writing, um, do you oftentimes worry as a poet that your reading might not be interpreted in the way you want the readers to? And uh, while editing or even while writing, do you modify your poems in the way you, it would make the, re uh, the readers to understand? Or do you just leave them up to the readers? Up to the reader. Short answer, totally, completely up to the reader. It's not complete without you. Just as yeah. it doesn't make sense. I mean, it does to me when I'm reading aloud because then I'm the reader. One last question, Anish, you wanted to ask something, yeah. Sorry, Naveen, if you will let me read also from Streets of Widows, Please. just a little later. Please go There's ahead. a beautiful section that goes, later when you were to ask me about what happened, I would open my mouth and show you the sores on my tongue. And I think that goes with knotted grief, right? Because yeah. knotted is also physicality. You have a knotted stomach and there is physicality in this poem that reminds me a little of something like Arun Kolatkar's Jezuri where the old crone shatters into pieces when you observe her. Another poem. So yeah. what is the physicality in this poem or in these poems and who are you in conversation with and who are you speaking to, with, towards? I think literally ghosts, I guess. You know, there are so many memories, so many people, so many personal things. You know, there's a grandmother hovering somewhere, but I'm turning that into a victim of a certain kind of atrocity, perhaps. Um, especially the sores, you know, it's very strange that you bring that up because the sores in this case was actually a grandmother who was bedridden for many, many years. 
And I was my mother's apprentice in the physical act of cleaning, which was not a very easy one to do, right? Uh, so, you know, all kinds of things come as images, but then you obviously turn them into something else. You turn and you create your own fiction in a sense. So thank you for picking that up. Yeah, done. Time to go. They want us away. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thank you, Tabino. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Ranji. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this was first edition brings knotted grief. We'd like to thank Naveen Kishore, Ranjit Hoskote, and Tabina Anjum. Please note that Naveen will be signing his books at the book signing desk, which is located behind the seating at the front lawns. I must remind you that we are in the middle of a climate emergency. Each one of us has to be conscious and respect the environment in order to move towards a sustainable future. We encourage all of you to implement the conscious reuse of water bottles. There are water dispensers to fill them. Furthermore,